Hello and welcome back everybody to this week's episode of LARPs and Tarps and today we're going to be talking to uh, the creators of the Feast Your Eyes event Forlorn Hope which is uh, a Peninsula War based LARP uh, set in like around the era of when the, the Sharp TV series came out. Or it could be called Schlarp. Or, or as it is infamously known, Schlarp. Uh, I am joined by uh, Tom. Hello there. And we are uh, joined also wonderfully by our two guests. We're joined by Harry. Hello. Use his full name. Sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Harry Knight, creator of Forlorn. <laughs> Easter Eyes it, it, it's event actually, by Harry Knight. It's Harold K. Knight, right? <laughs> Harold K. Knight. <laughs> yeah. My middle name is also Knight. <laughs> <laughs> We're joined by Harry Knight Knight and, uh, <laughs> and Kitty. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, good, thanks. Not uh, too bad. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I think we're about, has it been a week since Forlorn Hope? It's been about yeah. two weeks because I two pretty weeks. much died after Forlorn Hope. <laughs> yeah. I, I those first four boy. days after don't count, do they? They're like, they're, they're like Wednesday after the laugh is when you start to remember who, what your name yeah. is and what your job <laughs> is and what you can do, yeah. It's, it takes a while to reset of not having to check that you've got your sword and your gun when you leave. <laughs> it was a war zone so bl- brutal I came back with plague. <laughs> Mate. Oh. I mean, so I laugh, we... but very rough. Lot flu is a thing. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, well, it was like we had that when we first went to our first lab because it was like fresh as flu. It's exactly the same oh, yeah. thing. You're all just full of the lurgy. You have to um, go into the horrible pool of, of germs that is lop soup. As, as a populace yet yeah, yeah you but. need to get your larp soup immunization we're getting there two years. <laughs> i think we're good now so this uh for uh schlarp uh tom and i were in well actually i only crewed the sunday but you crewed the whole thing didn't you i did crew the whole thing and what a lovely experience it was i have always wanted to do something revolving around the napoleonic war but never had the money for reenactment, so this seemed a fantastic jumping in point. Yeah, in fact, it's I, so I know. So, what in fact, probably a good idea for you two to give us a bit of an outline of what your kind of role within the game was, like what your responsibilities were, how you kind of helped it to come into kind of existence. I know it's very, you know, your Harry's name's on the title, but I know you both had a big part in creating the LARP. So, Harry, do you want to give us a bit of an overview of like what you did for the game, like what you are to the game, um, kind of like what part you played in its creation i suppose so i'm the sort of quote unquote game runner uh i write a decent amount of the plot mostly uh the sort of main line of how the event's going uh pretty much all the combat stuff because that's kind of my forte uh i generally sort of corral the crew into doing what needs to be done uh at the actual event um and that's yeah. That's kind of the long and short of it. Um, I play a couple of NPCs. Generally, if the players need to be taken somewhere, or if there's pyro going off um, from our X and S effects team, generally I'll have a more active hand. But a lot of the time, I'm sitting in crew, uh, kind of like Charles Xavier, just like thinking <laughs> really hard about all the stuff that has to happen to make the event work, all the different timings, what encounters have to go out, uh, what props need to be where, which is kind of where kitty then steps in yeah it's it's great because um i'm usually in the hot seat for uh, for a lot of the um well okay i came up with like a whole stagecoach analogy to try to calm harry down from his like anxious ball of is this game going okay kitty you know like i'm usually in the driving seat and so it was really nice to be riding shotgun um uh, and and have a big gun and have a lovely time <laughs> shooting people and um and be saying and stuff while harry was the one who was having to deal with all of the horrible amount of anxiety about running games <laughs> um, um but no he, he, he's doing a fab job and um i think after the first game harry referred to it as like his love letter to combat crewing and um sure. yeah. and you can really see that that is that's very much the vibe is like it is it's, it's so much fun to crew this game and the reason that the crew tickets always sell out in about 20 seconds is because it is so much fun being a little french guy running around as as i'm sure tom will, <laughs> will tell you I didn't actually play a French guy that much. I just really got into dodgy English privates. You excuse well, me? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
There's a lot of dessert to role play for old Tom. Any time I was like, I need <laughs> I someone kind of shifty to go in and like rabble rouse. Tom yeah, would, put a, would put a shackle yeah, on sideways and he would go straight into straight into the camp. God, he was it was cute. the role I was born <laughs> to play. As soon as I saw treacherous red coat in the scripts, like. I want that one. The real, I feel like the real meta gaming for this game was if you saw Tom enter the player field as a player, you're like, ah, a deserter. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of, of, all the, of all the graves by the end of the game that would be made by the players and like laid out in a lovely line that looked very, you know, it looked really atmospheric as like set dressing that the players were doing bit by bit. How many of those graves were you, Tom? I think it was two in the end. You okay. told me three. Okay. It could have been three. I think I deserted. I'm trying to remember. Was it three or four <laughs> times I deserted over the weekend? <laughs> it was a lot, but it was a fantastically fun time. So thank you very much for the crewing <laughs> opportunity. We just know you're a dodgy geezer now. <laughs> Little dodgy geezer. No. Uh, I must ask, how did you come up with the idea of Fall on Hope, what inspired you to do a Napoleonic Wars LARP? So a lot of it was just me and Kitty, uh, obviously at stages of our youth, watching too much Sharp, really. That's kind of the starting point. Yeah. Um, I've got a deep love of Sharp in all of its low-budget glory. Uh, I've got a deep love of the Napoleonic period more generally. Um, I've got a background in history, and so that stuff really, really appeals to me. Um, and I kind of always had ideas bouncing around my head of how a uh, Napoleonic LARP would work, because obviously it's got to be fairly small scale, it's got to be very rules light, you've really got to play up sort of the social mores of the era. These are all the things you can kind of build role play around. And looking at Sharp, it's like 15 people uh, fighting against 15. Roughly the same number of French people because it was very low budget. So therefore, it's actually quite easy to replicate uh, mm. in a lot. And then I think I was probably just chatting to Kitty about it, and then they cudgeled me over the back of the head with, hmm. "Anyway, you've got a slot in the calendar now, so better get writing." <laughs> yeah, but that's that's how I do it. <laughs> uh, I, I've got a very similar thing. Of, I, I just absolutely love. Uh, I think I just grew up on a lot of like Granada TV in the late nineties, early two thousands, and like. That kind of like gung ho, like you can clearly see that there, there's like eight um, extras in the background who are sharing five rifles, and like it's kind of low budget but making it work, and like that that kind of um, it, it just really works really really well with the kind of film sim ethos that that we use at, at Feast Rise and our lap games. Like you, you know you're in the movie, you know you're in that kind of the setting, uh, and you can kind of figure out what the kind of levers are to pull in that without too much help because you can kind of figure out what would sharp or a you know or named character in a similar kind of tv show do in this situation okay well maybe that's something i could do you know um it just it, it just is a great sandbox to be playing in um and it was lovely to be working with somebody who was just like I've got 20 ideas because God, I don't have any ideas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that well is just, oh, I'm scraping the bottle of the barrel. It's just, it's just at, at this point, it's just, uh, you know, merchant needs help in counter number 23. Like that's all I got. <laughs> it's, it's, so it's just 25. Yeah. It's just, it's just 25 guys. They just need help. <laughs> all of them. I mean, with the hoist, Bandit. you did. With Hoist, you did inspire the cock cannon, so you do, do still have some yeah. prime material in there. Yeah, I, I basically shouldn't be allowed to go in on Fridays because uh, inevitably I'll do something awful. Well, like, <laughs> so, okay, this is a tangent. Sorry, I know I'm awful with tangents. No, no, we love so I, tangents I've, here. I have, I've heard a rumour about Matt Pennington that he's not allowed to go in on Fridays <laughs> anymore because he, he will bring a fez from somewhere they've locked up all the fezes they've burnt the fezes <laughs> fezes are not allowed anymore but he somehow finds a fez and he goes into game and he will wear that fez and cause some sort of international diplomatic incident and then has to be taken away because he's like i'm the king of Asabea. <laughs> like, well you've heard it here is, folks yeah that's that's the level i'm going for is disruption on a friday that will cause uh, ripples for the rest of the weekend and that I See, will be I... going oh no what have I done 
I now feel the need to confirm or deny this hot this rumor. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> it, it might just be a rumor, but you know, that's what yeah, I get. Heard. Matt, our special guest on this episode. Matt, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Matt, are you free? To, are you free to jump on? We've got a question for you. <laughs> Uh, brilliant that's that's I'm gonna I'm really I read it in the moon uh, no I'm really gonna be keeping that <laughs> yeah. a man, a man yeah. in affairs Running this, this is moon fire. information if ever this I've heard it serious moon information <laughs> king of Asabaya where's affairs <laughs> the best <laughs> the best parish magazine in all the empire uh, <laughs> it is the uh, Sorry. it is the horrible thing of I used to, I'm that guy on the Friday night, I show up to crew and I'll have a few beers and I'll put on whatever silly clothes are available and I'll sort of <laughs> have a have a goofy little tone with my friends. Now I have to be there like you can't have fun. You have to do the things I've told you to do. Yeah. This is really it's important. His medicine. Or everyone <laughs> <This> ignores is... <laughs> me. Every time oh. Harry is a silly prick uh, in in the crew area uh, on the, uh, like eleven o'clock on a Friday night when we're desperately trying to get out, the one thing that's happening on a Friday, I, I can I can remind him of the stress that he was under. It that exactly that uh, full on hope, and it it really helps. So uh, I'm <laughs> I'm just going to be doing that generally to anybody who's annoying uh, <laughs> or loud or just uh, you need to you need to slowly encourage them to run a game. Like that's yeah. the slow revenge. After they've annoyed you, you should run a LARP. We've got a slot for Threaten a LARP. Right game. now, yeah. deal yeah. with it. I'm yeah, going to be a right. silly prick for the next hour and you have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, don't get me wrong. Uh, genuinely, one of my favourite games in the calendar all year is Full on Hope every time. And um, yeah, I'm, really, I'm, I'm just really cheesed to be talking about it, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounded... It, because you can, you can point at me and go, if you're not good at the crew meetings, you could end up like him. And I'm yeah. Yeah. head in my hand. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, one of my favorite things about it, what, like before we sort of start, is that Harry plays one of the main NBCs. He is like the 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 top brass of this unit of British soldiers who were for some reason in the Iberian Peninsula during the uh, Napoleonic Wars, the, the um, Peninsula Wars. And um, the thing about is it the Earl of Chatham? The Earl of Chatham. The Earl of Chatham. He has such a delicate NPC. constitution. He is in charge. He is the man at the top, and he is allergic to everything, or able to be able to pick up any kind of normal disease in in the region of Spain that they're in, and so spends the majority of the event hiding away in a in a hut, going oh oh oh. oh. <laughs> so they simply cannot ask him any questions, or or you know be a, like have to defer to that chain of command because the guy who was in charge is well the first one he had dysentery didn't he <laughs> yeah the first one he ate some uh the, f- the first one he ate some imported oysters uh which obviously did the did the devil's work to him but and very far from the sea in the game <laughs> very far from the sea in every game and then in the second one the players intercepted an oyster delivery on the friday night which People still say that was their favourite encounter, and I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> Weren't they fresh from the Thames? Fresh from the Thames, yes. Because I want, yes. you know, the Earl would would say something along the lines of, oh, well, want those, don't want any bloody foreign oysters, do you? <laughs> <laughs> These are the oysters that my father and his father used to eat. <laughs> They're the best available. These are the oysters that filter out the shit and piss of the Thames. That's what you yeah. want. The finest oysters Thames around. fresh. <laughs> uh, and, and they, they took the oysters away from the Earl at the second game. Uh, that was two weeks ago. And so he just ate a lot of a cheese board and had horrible lactose intolerance. <laughs> Beautiful. So you've kind of moved on to my next question already. I was going to ask, <laughs> you've played very prevalent characters in the game. Uh, how did you enjoy playing them and how did it affect the role? Obviously, we've now heard about the wonderful <laughs> Earl of Chatham. How about you, Kitty? What's your fall on Hope lead character? Uh, well, so Harry needed somebody who could take people out on uh, missions, but who also wasn't necessarily like in the chain of command so that there wasn't like um, that kind of headbutting role play of, uh, you know, that I'm actually a higher rank than you. So, no, I don't want to go out on that mission. So um, he ended up writing me a character um, sort of based on uh, Teresa from Sharp, who's um, one of the love interests of Sharp in the early sort of seasons. Um, who uh, is um, like a renowned Spanish partisan fighter. Um, and so it basically just means that I get to wear a lovely waistcoat and have a big gun and then occasionally show up in, with a terrible Spanish accent that I can't do unless I am wearing that waistcoat um, and um, and just go, something's happening, we're going this way, you know, we need to go over there. I have information, 
we must take it to this person. It's just a bit of a plot device so that we can actually get, you know, information out there and they can, you know, figure out a, a, a lot of it. They figure out themselves, which is one of my favorite things about this as well, is that because we've got the whole group of riflemen in the lovely green jackets, they love scouting. So we'd never have to tell them exactly where something is. We can just tell them the general bit, like location and then they can just have a lovely 15 minutes of finding it um, ahead of the rest of the battalion. Um, so there's there's two Spanish players, I believe, in the last there's, two games. There's currently two. Um, who yeah, I, I love them both dearly. <laughs> they get a lot of very fun stuff, the Spaniards. Um, yeah. You know, they're fine yeah, for they're their um, Of course I get to write them some cool yeah. things every now and again. It's it's really fun as well. Like they're they're yeah. It's um because we're not in the in the main kind of line of uh, um you know order of the the military. We're we're the partisans who are locals who have local information or who have um you know local skills and and contacts and stuff like that. Um, it means that we kind of automatically have a, a bit more kind of boots on the ground kind of vibe compared to the like sure. fish out of water kind of thing that a lot of the other soldiers have. But it just also means that I get to play a character called El Gato, who is just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, yeah, just I can have very silly hair. And, um, and and it's also like because of the way that Harry's written it with um, the kind of gender roles that we, we have at Full on Hope that isn't really part of any of the other Feast Rise or I Love games. Um, there's um, it, if you're playing uh, a soldier, you're um, read as a man within the setting, regardless of like OC. Mm. Um, gender expression um if you're a civilian there's there's male and female civilians if you're spanish it's basically you know <laughs> non-binary pronouns absolutely fine in the spaniards because you know there's translation problems there and you know <laughs> who knows there's, like, there's so many uh so many genders to language outside of the english language <laughs> it's literally fine um uh, so it kind of means that I can go to the officer's mess because El Gato is technically awarded the um, uh, a lieutenant's position. However, I'm also a lady. So what would they like? So, so I, I, yeah, a lot of them are very nice and deferential, but also rather than um, deferring to me as a lady, like they do to the, to the people sure. who are playing so, civilian ladies, um, which is a whole other side of the game, which is very fun. Um that plays with a lot of those kind of prone and prejudice kind of stereotypes, which is, you know, very much opt in. Um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a nice way to be sort of a part of every part of the game without necessarily, you know, focusing too hard on any one of them. So yeah, it's been really fun. I just oh. like having a big gun and my, and I, I think I might've talked to you guys before about my, um, the curse I have with guns. So like at, at lead, I have only ever successfully fired a gun maybe twice. Whereas, at this, my gun goes off every time because it's a flip lock <laughs> and my curse doesn't apply. So it's a lovely time. God, I shot Harry so many times. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I, I, I get shot so often at this game because I always have to lead the rest of the crew into the combat encounters when I decide to do combat, which means I'm always at the front of the big column of French infantry who get gunned down like dogs uh, pretty consistently. I wanted to ask actually, what were the, um, how does character classes work in? the game because i know there was a few when i was i did a three hours of crewing on the sunday um i wanted to know what was the kind of i got the brief about the green coats but how do you kind of what's character creation like for the game so going into writing for lord hope i knew that i wanted character creation to be like very easy to remember to feel impactful at cool role play moments and to give like an inherent sense of who your character is. So going into character creation, you basically pick um, whether you're a soldier or a civilian, you pick your social rank, and then you pick one of a big list of traits. And the traits are kind of what fleshes out your character a bit more, or makes you a bit more individual, and also for some of them gives you like a cool special ability. So the rifleman, for example, if you want to be Richard Sharp, the guy from the TV show, uh, they, get, they get to, unlike everyone else in the game, they get to basically yell at the crew when they're shooting at them. So you're there, you're a rifleman, you see a crew member, they've got like, I don't know, particular facial hair like I do, or they're wearing a particular hat. And you can go, hey, you with the moustache, or you with the hat, or you hiding behind that tree, 
which means you're getting the crew members' attention. So it's more likely they will turn around and look at you and then will role play, role play accordingly when they shoot you. So this also means that as everyone else can't do that, it kind of replicates muskets being a little inaccurate at times. Because, you know, if you're just firing volleys into people, sure, it might not do anything, but it's a smooth ball musket. That's kind of to be expected sometimes. Um, I got taken out at the worst possible time by a rifleman. I was really enjoying that big, cool, fiery scene when the French were raiding the town. I got shot in an alleyway. It's like, I can't see any of the cool effects now. <laughs> I want to see everything around me, but I just can't. Let me crawl through this alley so my death is more cool. <laughs> well, no, they shot We've me and then it. just We've stabbed me. Oh. I, I was just was it like wiped a, a self kill? No, it was shot and then make sure he's down, stab. <laughs> well, no special effects for Tom. No, Sad. just got to look at all the all the lovely photos that people take of the game and imagine what <laughs> oh, it's like. The Tox did a great job. <laughs> they did a very they good job. A, Them and the SFX team. It's a beautiful team. game. It really is. Is that category you were just talking about, the chosen men? Chosen men. Yeah, it's chosen men. Which neither of us can say well <laughs> enough, as, as well as you two probably could. But... Chosen men. Chosen no, men. They're doing all right. That's, oh, we it. Have, That's it. We, we have to deal with... Uh, oily. We have to deal with Oily, who loves oh, to do an accent. God. <laughs> and he was, doing a northern, he was doing a northern accent for a Now My Watch Begins. And he'd quite frequently say a word that was just not. <laughs> not and I would just turn to him and be like... Do you want to say that again, lad? I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> and he'd be like, shut up. Because <laughs> I think he was doing a Scott this weekend. He was. Yes. He was. Scott. He was. Such a wonderful one of the highlanders. I couldn't go near him. Like, I couldn't go near him when I was doing, I was being Al Gatto because it was so, it was such a, like a contagious accent. And because I do a terrible Scottish accent for Five Kingdoms as a dwarf, that I've, uh, it was like a, a player character that now is occasionally an NPC. And so every single time I went over to him, I had to be like, uh, like, I'd start saying "I" in response to this <laughs> terrible <stuff. laughs> So bad. Did, did you hear that they uh, sort of adopted a, an extra Scot, like a, a proper Scot, a real Scot, who a real, was real their Scott. lieutenant? Yes, they, who, who they did. Really wasn't expecting to, to be in charge of a, a regiment of a Highlanders because he just assumed he'd be the only Highlander. Then there was loads there of Highlander there. privates so who were just like, "Orders, <laughs> sir. What do you want us to do?" <laughs> <laughs> He does. <laughs> Just imagine it. Oh. You show up to a game. You don't know anyone. You're not expecting to have actual command, and you've immediately got four people doing a bad in impression of your own actual <laughs> accent, showing up, drinking iron brew, sharing tablet and, and, and shortbread. And little, and little what do you hats? do? <laughs> <laughs> so silly. I mean, that, I feel like sorry, I should we... be mad, but <laughs> I also absolutely. I absolutely <laughs> loved you and Circuit setting people up in the officer's mess, by the way, Kitty, and getting your accents crossed. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> Every single time Circuit is crewing and I know that there's going to be bad Scottish accents around, I'm like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, the Scots are always the first to arrive because there's like four of them now who get the, the coach down from like various places. Like they get an overnight coach on Thursday night, which is just a level of commitment that <laughs> very it's, few of us it's, it's really do. It's unhinged. They it's arrive at like 10am and they're like, we've not slept. Ah, what can we do, Diddy? Like circuit, oh. circuit or Nathan or Aiden just show up and they're just like, you're right. Yeah, we thought we'd just nip down. Like, what do you mean nip down? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a 12-hour We walked from the you. station. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because they get the sleeper, don't they? So like they yeah. end up being the, ah, oh, it's insane. I think it's, I think it's, sleep. yeah. I think it's madness, like, <laughs> us coming down, because it takes us, like, five hours. I've but, learned like... how much I rely on you going to this lab. Eleven <laughs> hours it took. Yeah, you took the coach down, so you took it took you, like, a, the best part of a week to get there. <laughs> um... uh, God bless Northern Transport. <laughs> anyway, back on topic. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. So... What are the other traits, Harry? Uh, there's, there's a bunch of really good ones. Uh, one of my favourites is <laughs> Wealthy. <laughs> Which is oh yeah. So if you're wealthy at the start of the game, uh, I will give you between one, like between three and four massive checks, <laughs> which are like comedy <laughs> checks. Uh, they're, they're pretty big, <laughs> and basically these represent like more money than a person could easily carry. They're like big money. Um, 
and you can kind of just use them to do whatever. Most encounters have like a, if the players offer you a massive check, you are just bribed instantly and just spill your guts. So wealthy's a lot of fun. I didn't fun see any of the massive checks. The massive checks. Did, did one get used? There was that. Uh, the, there was a pair of players who both fell in love with the same NPC woman, was, mm. was, wasn't there? Yep. And um, one of them paid the other off with a massive check to to go away and let him marry her. Yes, they did. I think there was also uh, at the last game. I believe when visiting like a Spanish refugee camp to give out arms. Uh, they gave a massive check out to the person <laughs> like leading up the refugees to basically be like check. buy supplies. A massive check. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than the massive checks, there's Die Hard. I feel like as well, which is just Sorry, I'm I feel like I feel like I feel like massive check. I feel like I feel like when you're giving a massive check, every time you have to pause and look to camera, <laughs> yeah, like in character, you have to stop. Hey. Will you, will you come with us on this dangerous, life-changing mission if I give you this? Massive check. You just need two confetti cannons to shoot out every time as well. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, they, they catch like a French officer and they're like, I will never reveal our secrets unless you have a massive check. <laughs> <laughs> You can't, you can't really see the twiddling of the moustache over, uh, like, podcasts. I feel like no. you, I really feel like you can missing. feel it. Yeah. That was quite yeah, the yeah. format. Yeah, Duelist absolutely. is fun as well. Like there were a couple of really good duels last event. Duelist is good; just makes you uh, better at winning duels. Uh, Die Hard is a personal <laughs> favorite because um, there's a traumatic wound system, a forlorn hope, uh, where occasionally a ref will just hand you a little slip of paper. On the outside, it says like, "This is how you're feeling at the moment," and often it's like you've been shot. Uh, and on the inside, uh, <laughs> the surgeon characters, surgeon being another trait which you can take if you want to be a doctor, can open these up which will tell them how to heal you, basically. Die Hard lets you ignore the effects of a traumatic wound until the current encounter ends, and then it just kicks in immediately. So it's classic, like, yeah, oh, I've been is. mortally wounded, but I'm so hard and cool that I just keep going until I get back to camp, and I immediately fall on my face, and I'm just bleeding to death in front of everybody. It, it's the, okay. the classic, like, there's just been a massive skirmish, it's been very physical, and then all of a sudden, the main character pulls their hand away from their stomach, and it's covered in blood. Ah, shit. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what, And they're like, I'll be fine. And actually, they're not fine. Yeah. Actually, Is that what no. old Colander Cavendish has? I, I, I don't think Colander Cavendish does have that. I think Colander Cavendish is a fop. So he can just speak <laughs> right. French yeah, yeah. and yeah. is foppy. Which I think sure. is... That would be... That sounds like the best character choice in the game. That's why most people are fops if yeah. they're an officer. If they're an officer. I, mean, like, yeah. like I, have, I have a brother of Thor's oh, Yeah, it's, it's a lot of that. <laughs> The amount of times that line about horse guard was said over the weekend, it made me truly happy. Yeah. Uh, Who doesn't have friends at horse guard at this point? Yeah, what? quite frankly. Are they all the same guy? Like, <laughs> 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 the same <laughs> they all went to like the same private school and one of them got into horse guards and the rest just leaked. <laughs> <their head. laughs> I have, I have friend... In horse guard. I'll have you know. That should be one of your NPCs next time. The friend yeah. from horse guard comes to visit. I'm going to write uh, that down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, um, I wanted to, so you spoke about the surgeons and I wanted to ask a question because I heard about a particularly grisly piece of special effects. Oh, I was so gutted I didn't see the special which effects. Which I really want to hear about, which involved... Um, uh, a saw, uh, and I'd yeah. love to hear more about like that in so, addition to some other gory effects. So part of the reason that Tom didn't see that is because all the people who came on the horrible traumatic wound encounter at that point are the people who because there was two missions going out at the same time, and one of them was your what we call what we in crew call a classic juicy boys encounter, which is a whole, a whole level of context needed for that. Uh, where was, <laughs> Harry, can you explain the juicy boys encounter very quickly? Ma so, maybe the original as well as I'll this explain one. the original and where the name came from. Uh, for those of you who can't see my face listening to this through. The, the medium of audio. Uh, my head is firmly in my hands at this point. So 
at my first ever ILARP game, first ever game at Eversley, uh, when I was still very new to LARPing, um, there was the bad guys were essentially um, Confederate holdovers who the Civil War had ended, the Confederacy had been wiped out, but there were still some diehards who were just like, we're the worst people around and we're going to keep being terrible. Um, as part of this, there was an encounter where the players got to essentially sneak up on a little camp of these holdouts um, and like ambush us all out of the darkness at like 11 p.m., gun us all down. But they could also, while they were sneaking around, listen in to what we were saying because we were dropping little bits of information. Uh, and the information was essentially, oh, our reinforcements are coming and they've got a, they've got a gift, air quotes. Um, <laughs> after about an hour of sitting in the woods in the cold and the dark, we kind of just completely lost the plot. Um, <laughs> so oh, our reinforcements are coming with a cannon, uh, which is what the gift was, turned into, oh, the juicy boys are coming with the girthy gift. <laughs> um, as well as us arguing about what mayonnaise is. Uh, it turns out the players had come out. They'd been sat in a bush for 45 minutes listening to us completely go off the deep end um, with essentially a lot of very homoerotically charged... Um, confederacy jokes um before standing up and gunning <laughs> down in cold blood uh so now that type of ambush encounter is uh is a is a classic juicy boys um so there was a, there was a classic juicy boys going on at the same time and, um, there was an awful lot of people in crew who basically were like hey kitty so um you know how when you go to a coffee shop and it's like you got you got seven you bought seven coffees and you, you get your eighth free. They were just like we've done seven juicy boys and carrots. Can we have this one off, please? And so all the who, who who were helping with me uh, and um, Circuit and Beck and and the little group of us who were kind of putting this on. Um, pretty much all the people who were playing Spaniards were the ones who were just like, please, no, we can't go and sit out in the woods yet another time and say three lines of dialogue <laughs> on repeat. Because we don't know when the players are there, like <laughs> we simply cannot please. Um, so they have a lovely, uh, a lovely break from that. By, um, I mean, they're going to be right back on that at flying lead finale. It's right back. Eighteen on there, but, juicy boy. Um, <laughs> you're hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> back to back, um, <laughs> all night. It's twenty four hour time in. But, um, <laughs> twenty four hour juicy boy. Account. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, from the players' perspective. Um, a group, uh, they'd previously been to uh, a very nice little village uh, called Lerma, Lerma, I believe. The village of Lerma. Lerma yeah, and they'd, they'd had a, a lovely encounter um, trying to find a... a um, what, it was a, it was was a missing position, postman. The, postman. the regimental postman had gone missing. And it turns out... Peter! <laughs> and it turns out he'd gone to this village where the Spaniards were celebrating because earlier in the game, uh, the players had assassinated a French general in this village. So the Spaniards were like celebrating. They're like, the French have all left. We're having a wonderful time. Our new red coat friend has just shown up. So we've just gotten him absolutely trolleyed. <laughs> um, so Peter was... the Postman uh, was having the time of his life in Lerma. Peter the Postman was a god by the end of that weekend. Everyone loved him. Yeah, it was it was lovely. Like so, so some of the refugees from Lerma, because the whole place had been burnt to the ground um, on a mission that a load of them had gone out to do. Um, we were basically playing, like, I was playing Elgato and um, Aiden was playing Alejandra, who was our kind of like our local guide for the weekend, uh, who's a very new crew member and is doing a fantastic job at learning how to not get people lost. And I mean, an essential part of that is learning, is getting people lost and then learning how to get yourself out of that situation. But that's, that's, that's just a part of Eversley. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so a little group of us Spaniards with horrible injuries come in and um are immediately waved through the gate because they recognize like two of us and and take us to the um the sort of infirmary area um and um so circuit was was there ready as the kind of uh, relief nurse in in the in the in the room because we we had a, a regular character called mary who's the nurse who's there pretty much all the time who's played by our friend ren um uh, but Ren is vegetarian and didn't want to be part of this encounter, which was fair enough. So um, Circuit swung in as the as a sort of replacement. Um, and essentially what happened was this uh, Pablo, the, the crack shot of Lerma, who was like the best uh, shooter in town, he'd had his leg blown off um, and um, his boot was essentially just full of blood 
And uh, as soon as um, they had him down on the table, um, the traumatic wound, which was like peeled open because it was so full of blood, just said amputate in red writing that got more and more sort of deranged as it went through and then just like a pile of blood, <laughs> um, which is a lovely little touch that Harry did, I think. Um, yep, I wrote it in, I wrote it, felt and, it, and then just dragged it through the nearest pool of fake <laughs> blood I could find on like the makeup table. <laughs> lovely. Um, a, a, a feast your eyes classic. Um, <laughs> and so the, the surgeons jumped to and they had to do this very immersive amputation scene, um, which involves an actual... Uh, hacksaw um, and cut through it and yeah it was, so it's like from their point of view you know very immersive from our point of view it was um, about two hours of <laughs> carnage trying to get it ready um, so essentially originally when um, when we were writing this encounter it was going to be another crew member who was going to be playing the um, the injured person um, who is kosher uh, and so we were originally going to use a, a, a pig leg and then had to sort of be like what does your rabbi say about using oh, no. like, like this is this is a level of of sort of spiritual analysis that I've never had to consider when making a prop before. Um, and so basically, we just like right, you know, let's just like leave it off. Like we we'd already um, planned to use a lamb leg instead, um, so we just went with that anyway. And basically, I just prop I, I just I just love the idea of being like call your rabbi. We yeah, need to right know now. if we can yeah. pretend right now if you yeah. can kosher wise chop a pig's leg. Like, <laughs> if it's just next to your leg, is that okay? You don't have is to that fine? Like... <laughs> These are the big questions. Lark the fact, brings the fact Edgy's uh, also a vegetarian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, no. kind of the double barrel yeah, that I was like, the... okay, I'll pick someone else. Because uh. <laughs> Johnny was just like, babe, we can't, we can't do lamb. It's, lamb's too nice. I will be annoyed if we have to. Like, lamb's expensive. Uh, not from Costco. Yeah, well. and because. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> and because because we live in Wales as well, it's like the, the, it's like the thing that you have on menus that is really like the, the higher end thing that's really nice. And so he associated mm. it with just like me, me basically just throwing money at the window. It's the national <laughs> leg. You can't use that. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so God. the budget didn't go on the explosive. It went on the lamb. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah no. Um, <laughs> But um, so we had this lamb leg that um, so Circuit had sort of stumbled upon me with my sleeves rolled up, wearing like rubber gloves, wandering around the the Wild West town, looking very sort of confused. And, like I was fairly in a in a in a train of thought, and they sort of came over and were like, "You're right," <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, come with me." Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, perfect person arrived at that time. Um, so I'd had this, I, I'd been coating this leg of lamb in latex, but because it had been so damp, it just hadn't dried. And so H, had, the uh, RSFX like, he head, uh, H, had given me his heat gun, but I couldn't, it was drying the latex, but it was also cooking the lamb. And then it was also melting the table. And so I couldn't oh, lift no. it up. I didn't know about um, this. Because I've, I've got a bit of a shoulder problem. So like, it was, it was... It was a struggle. And so I basically had had circuit on like rotisserie duty, just like turning this thing like constantly while we put layer after layer after layer of liquid latex until it had such a, a crust on it that it looked like a proper human leg. And then we had like a, a good 20 minute discussion about whether we should add hair. <laughs> and so like it was just like it looks pretty good. And then um I hacked at it wildly with abandon with a hatchet until it was it was like clearly that was where it needed to be cut off at you know um yeah. and then circuit went and got a load of shrapnel and then just like jammed it all into the legs so it, it looked really gnarly and then we had a, a boot that had been there was a pair of boots that were left on site by um a film that we had to do a little like little student film recently and they just left a load of stuff and so we had these this pair of boots so in in one of the boots there was um like a prop severed foot that was just like a rubber one that looks a bit naff um filled the boot with blood <laughs> Um, and then Circuit had the rest of it set up. And so as soon as we got back in position as as, as Pablo, he was lying down um, with his real leg between the, the end of the table and the like bench that was on the end of that. Um, so it's kind of hiding it. And then um, one of the, um, I can't remember if it was one of the Spaniards or one of the players got sent into the, the um, uh, officer's mess to go and take the tablecloth because it was an emergency to rip open and put over Pablo so that it was like a surgical cover on him. Um, so that all the surgeons could see was 
like the shape, the leg, everything there. And basically they tried to take the, the boot off, um, the like fake leg, leg setup that was along the table with Beck's real leg um, and basically pulled the boot off and then looked inside the boot and went, oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> One of the surgeons handed the boot to another surgeon, both of whom went, uh, um, uh, I'll just put that over there. <laughs> um, the the lady doctor, I can't remember. Oh, do you remember her name? Her in character name? Oh, it has completely skipped my mind. Unfortunately, two weeks have gone by. We're, we're referring to them as the Scottish doctor, the fop doctor, and the lady doctor because um, <laughs> all three of them were were so you know, so fantastic characters that, that that they were just sort of they were bouncing off each other really really well. And um, it was only the lady doctor who's returning from the first game. Um, so we were really glad that she was the one who got stuck into this. Because um, also in character, she's not got a medical degree because she's a woman. Um, you know, this is all just yeah. like a flight of fancy that is her hobby that she's really into. And all of the male characters, like in her like OC social circle, are just like, oh, she's so funny with her little, little ways. And how, you know, <laughs> oh, and make sure you don't faint, darling, at the sight of blood. And there she is, like with a hacksaw in hand, I'm, just like going at I'm it. I'm pretty sure that because um, we wrote a whole load of IC letters, which this um, postman encounter basically had on him for the players to read. And so I sent out a form. All the players sent back stuff that maybe could be written about them. Um, a bunch of the crew helped me write them. Um, I'm pretty sure that her character's one was a rejection letter from a medical school going, don't be yeah, silly, you're was, a woman. Yeah. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she got that at dinner. And then this happened after dinner. So it was kind of like a, you know, two fingers up at, at that school for rejecting her kind of thing. But she, you know, she she was handed the saw, like she she kind of assessed the situation. The two gentlemen were there to assist, to, to, they were like in charge, but they were assisting, you know, and they, and they were, as um, players, they were absolutely fantastic in like sharing game in that in that situation. It was fantastic. Sure. Um, but they basically held out the, the like white enamel bowls that were filled with fake blood and bits of, you know, the foot at that point and things and just allowed her to sort of get on with it. Um, and then Circuit had two syringes full of fake blood underneath, like all the apparatus. So as um, she was, as uh, oh. the lady doctor was cutting into it with this um, with this hacksaw and cutting through the bone, uh, basically Circuit that was then like squeezing this like jet of blood out and and hitting her like in the hands and in the arms with it. Um, so it was just like I don't know. It was very visceral. It was very um, sort of old school uh kind of hammer horror in a way that i really really yeah. enjoy doing um it was and and i think it was a very like it was a really intense experience but what was really funny was afterwards i think everyone was so like up on adrenaline um especially beck who was the patient and they were like lying there the entire time like screaming they'd almost bitten through a leather belt because they were role playing oh wow so hard <laughs> um it was beck did a phenomenal but clearly job. nobody nobody Oh, they're yeah. fantastic. Um, they just won crew member of the year as well in the Love Awards. Hey. Oh, wow, that's great. For that. um, but they, um, like everybody in the room sort of didn't know what to do after that. And they were sort of wandering around aimlessly holding things. <laughs> holding holding they're covered in blood, and blood. Going, uh, uh. And then um, because these all the crew members had been this like joyful little pub of in Lerma. They all started singing like my pizza lies over the ocean. Like every, everybody in the room had like a rousing like verse of this terrible song that they'd been drinking, uh, uh, singing earlier when they were like fake drinking. Um, and everybody sort of had like a laugh out of character and then sort of, you know, breathed and, and it was all kind of, it sort of burst the bubble in a really nice way. Um, Cause I think otherwise it could have been quite stressful. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> going from those kind of fake emotions. Oh. But as soon as Beck got up, they fell over because the sort of psychological nature of the whole scene, their leg had sort of gone dead and they'd kind of forgotten wow. that that was their real leg and that, it, you know, their real leg was fine and hadn't been cut oh. off. And it was it was such a weird phenomenon. It was cool. It, it was, was a really cool. Yeah, it was, really it was one of the most immersive, like, little vignettes I think I've ever seen it a lot. I remember I, I cheekily peered in from running another encounter to watch for, like, a couple of minutes. Uh, if you're of a squeamish disposition, I'll skip the next 30, 45 seconds. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Skip it, was, ahead. <laughs> it was when, at one point, this um, lady doctor was soaring through the leg. Got to a point where she thought she could just kind of snap the bone, which was right oh, the God, leg of yeah. was twisting it. Like, blood was going everywhere. Realised that it wasn't coming off, so just got the hacksaw back out again and just went back at it. Oh. And it was... Oh. Whoa. 
exactly what I had. It did look like at one point she was just going to like start biting at it <laughs> to get through the last few minutes because <laughs> everybody's like surgical like tools were obviously blunted because they're props. And so when they were actually yeah. trying to cut through like the meat, they were just like, oh no. <laughs> I think it was a pen knife that got through the last bit. <laughs> That is like yeah. to think of this like obviously this is like really cool effects and whatever, but like to think of this as an actual situation. Yeah, <laughs> like, where, yeah like, for sure. They're like f- finally then with a pen knife trying to take your leg off. I mean, um, it's why it was so impressive that people got it down to like thirty seconds, like cut get it cut off and yeah, sewn back up. Yeah, because that's the only way you can do it without anaesthetic. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think um, LARP's crazy for that. I was talking to a friend who went to like who goes to like a horror LARP. And they had, for a scene, had recreated somebody's head out of, like, um, some edible material because there was going to be, like, a cannibal scene where they were going to pull someone's head off and eat their brains. And um, the person, someone didn't know it was in the fridge and they opened the fridge door, saw it and threw up because their brain just couldn't work out what they were looking at. And my friend that went didn't know this was coming because they were a player and then they saw this head get revealed and what they'd done is they'd switch there'd been an actual person there and then whilst people weren't there they'd switch them out and then like they pulled off this person's head and ate the started to eat it Ooh. and she was like for a full five seconds my brain couldn't work like couldn't figure the fact that i wasn't looking at a real person wow their yeah. brain was just like like and it's like and it's crazy how like it, it's funny you say like Beck falling over like it's crazy how your brain just sees stuff and goes, I I can't process <laughs> what's going on there. This is yeah. too real. Help! <laughs> it's so cool. Um, it's it's one yeah. of the really cool things about like theater and you know immersive theater and laugh and all that kind of like pool of things is just kind of what you can experience and what you can kind of yeah. process and how it all works. We've talked a lot about the gory side of the effect. Yeah, sorry. Harry, tell us... Oh, no, no, it's great. <laughs> Harry, tell us about the explosive side of the LARP. How did you uh, get all those cannonball effects and whatnot? So, set up? Uh, it's a game set during the Napoleonic Wars. There's got to be big bangs. That's kind of the longest short of it. If there wasn't a decent amount of pyrotechnics going off, I think you wouldn't really be hitting those kind of immersive notes of you're in a sharp episode, mm. right? So I'm very lucky to have um, H, who's part of the uh, Cytos FX team down at Eversley, who is incredibly skilled, knows exactly what he's talking about. I basically can just throw ideas at him and he'll just go, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, at the first game, for example, uh, which was the Full on Hope, so that involved uh, the players storming a French held fort on the Saturday night at about 11 slash midnight. Uh, some players, uh, some player sappers snuck up to this big fort building that there is at, uh, at Eversley and laid powder charges. And the following morning, H and, his, and uh, the rest of his team went out there, set up these um, big pots, which basically just throw material and debris and smoke up into the air above them. They kind of look like, they're, they're like big circular bits of tinfoil, basically. Um, so one of the players ran up for like a Wild West style plunger like lit a fuse, uh, the whole fort just went boom. Like the entire, like, how tall do you think the fort is, Katie? Like 10 foot, 12 foot? Six uh, yeah, two people standing on, on, yeah. So, like, yeah, 12 to 14 foot, I'd say. The like cloud from these pyrotechnics yeah. going off was about the same height, like, completely obscured it, like, tongues of fire, the whole nine yards. Uh, at the last game, so two weeks ago, we had. Uh, the opportunity for the players to find and operate a cannon. So um, Eddie, uh, fortunately, had a cannon hanging around, uh, just casually. So, like you do. Yep, casually. So they were an injured cannoneer who instructed the players through the proper Napoleonic procedure of loading and firing a cannon so it doesn't explode in your face. Um, on the path up towards the cannon, which is where the crew were essentially going to, as... French soldiers march in column. There was a whole bunch of these pots hidden around. So we synced it up decently well so that when the players finished loading the cannon, it went off uh, using a uh, blank fire gun in a bucket to make the initial noise. And then the SFX team detonated one of these pots. So the players get the fun of seeing the crew getting covered in shrapnel, getting covered in debris, getting flung around like ragdolls. 
uh, because in the first game, that encounter had been reversed and the players had been having to march through all these pyrotechnics going off on either side of them while they kind of advanced up the valley, which the fight was in. Um, but other than that, I mean, we had the burning of Lerma, which has been mentioned before, um, where we ran it at night and essentially it was set in the Wild West town, which Eversley has. And we set up these big SFX uh, pillars of flame, basically. Uh, so, and we use smoke machines to fill the whole place with smoke. So the whole place is like backlit by these massive flames. Uh, so the smoke sort of glowed this really eerie orange. There was smoke billowing out of like random houses um, from where some of the SFX guys, like Jay, for example, were in there with smoke machines. Um, looked absolutely fantastic. I mean, I think I owe a lot of Lawn Hope success to the SFX team and the willingness to essentially sort of figure out what they need to do from the very bad, rough guidance I write for them in all my plot docs. I heard from the first fall and hope about the effects. Like, ooh, I really need to go and see them. Hence, it's one of the reasons why I was so desperate to crew this one. It looked phenomenal, dude. You both did a fantastic job in making it feel like a peninsula hellscape. Because the thing for me, is which it? the um, the SFX, like, Big Bangs help with so well is... The immersion isn't just the aesthetics. It's also like the noise and the smell and mm. the sound, yeah. you know, when you can actually smell like cordite and you can just hear these like vomps going off in the background. It all just, it all just works. It just works. I think there's, there's, I mean, there's, uh, I think you're right on that because I, it was, the experience was really good in the final battle we mm. were in. There was less pyro, but there was like still that really good vibe. But it's also like after a gunfight in Flying Lead, for example, and there's like the smoke and the smell in the air, and it really does kind of take you there. So I can very much see. And I hear that Full On uh, Hope Episode 3 is going to have even more pyro. That is that is the plan. Yeah, I think the last one had a little less, right? Like the first one had definitely had more pyro than this last one. Uh, but partly, partly the idea of that was that we weren't going to kind of jump the shark and like every time have to like ramp it up more and more and more yeah. and more and more. <laughs> so like slightly different um, concepts, just... You know, th for this next one, it's going to be big. Plans. It's going to be real big. Uh, I've already got some. It's, it's, I, I, the neighbor. I've already got some fun plans. The neighbor's <laughs> going to be real upset. <laughs> well, things are in things are in motion. Lucky We've neighbor. raised the price point of the tickets explicitly, so all of the extra money from that increase in price is all going on pyrotechnics. So it's going to be a real yeah. a real stonker. It's, it sounds again. It sounds. I won't be able to go to the third one, unfortunately. But it sounds absolutely amazing um i did want to actually touch on something interesting that we've kind of mentioned lightly but i wanted to talk about it a little bit more is so uh feast your eyes and i love games are often gender uh blind i guess is the best way to put it it's like there's it doesn't really play a role in anything but in this game it does and i wanted to know how you um how you kind of handled that like because it was like a different thing and obviously there are um I think it's part of the highlight brief is that there's, there's these situations which are problematic and difficult for some people. But then in this game, I know it's kind of like a core part of the period. So I just was interested how you kind of handled that um, when you were making the game and running the game and stuff like that. So a lot of that was kind of written by um, two of our friends, uh, Esme and Ren, who kind of consulted with both of us at the start of that um, to kind of figure out what would be fun and what would be too much. Um, because like, it's such a, a great part of the sharp setting is the kind of the real dumb cliched like female characters who are either like falling in love with sharp immediately or you know betraying him in some hilarious way you know it's it's such a it's a, it's just really tropey and really fun to play with that kind of like villainous character or heroic character like heroines um that we just didn't really see a way that it could be gender neutral in the same way that all the other kind of games are um, but it is definitely something that like Harry and I went back and forth on for a long time. Um, probably the the most difficult thing about writing this game at the start, wasn't it? Definitely, definitely. Um, I think, I can't remember exactly who said this. I think it might have been Ren. But it was essentially what we didn't want was for a reenactment perfect, period accurate uh, example of Regency sexism, because that's not fun. Sure. We wanted to get yeah. all of those like Jane Austen tropes, all of those sharp tropes, all of those, you know, um, master and commander tropes. 
the things that are fun to play off um things that make the setting yeah like you know what it is that makes the napoleonic period what it is um but without in any way it feeling um like if you were playing a female character you wouldn't be having as much of a good time even if you like if you didn't want to buy into that role play right um and i think the really nice thing is that uh a significant number of the female characters at the last two games have been very happy to buy in um for example like sure. earlier i mentioned uh the letter saying you're not allowed into medical school that wasn't my idea that was that player writing in on this form and going maybe this would be a really cool thing to like show up in the game um and that's really great because i don't want to impose kind of yeah on people yeah, the sort of game they can enjoy. Line, so it? it's it's a really tricky scale it's a really tricky balancing act yeah but i think um largely thanks to uh Ez and ren and kitty i think we've kind of managed to hit it pretty well yeah nice. yeah uh, I, it's really good. i've been enjoying it <laughs> like there was there was a moment on the saturday night where um all the men had gone off um like uh, so all of the the soldiers and the the two Spanish um, partisans, plus then a couple of the surgeons, just to make sure things were were okay, had all run off round to Lerma to go and like deal with this big big fight that was you know with the fire and you know the kind of you know moonlit beautiful fire um, encounter. And so it, we kind of realised that the, um, the 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 ladies were all kind of left behind, and so. We OC ran over to just watch it, kind of out of character, just so that we could see the cool thing. Um, and then, as soon as the players had had, uh, you know, the fighting players had left that encounter area, and the crew were kind of striking the, the, the set and turning off all the fire and everything, we went, "Should we barricade ourselves into the officers' mess?" <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, so uh, El Ghetto and um, I can't remember what Ez's NPC uh, lady was this time. Um, but and and one of the uh, other like female characters, um, all the like upper class ladies, kind of ran into the officers' mess, which they were allowed access to. But a lot of the other, because there's also a lot of like uh, class divide as well between the kind of officers and the enlisted men, and that's another kind of sure. binary within it. Um, um, but because the ladies have access to the officers' mess, uh, we went inside there, and we were just like, what fun can we have while they're out that they can come back to? Uh, we 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 started barricading the walls, um, and then um, so there'd, there'd been like a full officers' dinner um, with name settings around the room, um, and so we just took all the benches and all the little stools and started making barricades on both the front and the back, and then we started drinking in the inverted commas all of the port that had been left by the officers to you know to steady our nerves in case there was a big battle. You know, um, and so all three of us were just like, you know, being silly. And we'd also accidentally barricaded one of the gentlemen who was a civilian gentleman inside with us because he happened to be in there when we started making the barricade. And so he wasn't allowed to leave at this point. Uh, and then because we were drunk at this point, um, we started getting all the name tags and then putting them back on the chairs where they were in the barricade. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and just, you know, being silly. And then, so when the, the, the officers came back from this mission and tried to go into the mess to have a sit down, Every time one of them tried to open the door, this barricade was like threatening to fall on them. Um, and then we were just like, what are, what are you ladies doing in there? Like, what, are, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> and then we were just accusing them all of being French spies and that what, it, like, you know, they had to <laughs> prove to us that they um, were, d weren't were some sort of French spy who was coming in here to, you know, um, impinge on our virtue or whatever. And like, you know, <laughs> threatening them. Like, bear in mind, both ladies by this point had two pistols each because, you know, it was, it was a, a desperate situation and of course you know in that kind of situation you've got to arm yourself with whatever you can um well, of course. and then yes. yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and so we only let them take things from the barricade if their name was on the stool <laughs> um, and and like the, the way that they proved to us that they were proper englishmen was um there was like a whole like dinner thing that they had to do when they were passing the port and like these like upper class games where they had to like say a particular phrase while passing the port one way and then passing the I don't know the rum a different way or something like that, and it was it was like a whole language that they had come up with that was like ah uh, okay it is you after all Major Fotherington you can come inside I suppose, um, but I, I was just having a lovely time just pretending to be drunk because that's my favourite thing to do a lot. <laughs>
the kit standards at the slop were excellent uh but you guys came up with the idea that people could rent kits do you think this made it this game a lot more accessible because i know in reenactment napoleonic kit costs an arm and a leg yeah, uh, we we had some friends who were who were going to come along, and they've got some extra stuff. So um, we had like a limited amount that we could rent out, but it it did make it easier being able to sort of say uh, like if you, if you need a jacket and a and a chaco because they're quite difficult to get hold of, um, and you're within this kind of size range, then we can sort you out with that. Um, it, it's a pity that um, the, like female kit is more difficult to get hold of because that's what we're really, we're really struggling with for crew as well, um, especially in like like a bigger size range than like Bridgerton because mm. uh, a lot of the time we get job <laughs> lots. It's like, well, this will be lovely for the two crew members who it will fit. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it is, it's definitely an issue. Um, but I think it, the, yeah. the, the kit was all, again, it was really fantastic though. Like, yeah, especially from the crew side as well. Um, Cause wearing like the blue, the blue coats and stuff, everything was really good uh, yeah. from that side. But yeah, like you say, I guess it is a, it is, I know there was a kind of there was a few ill-fitting coats, and then but the thing I guess with like dresses is they're even more like yeah. fitted. So getting them yeah. to fit well, I imagine. I've got the guns. So the trouble I have is that like I'll I'll try on a dress and be like this is nice, and then I'll flex at, at all. And It'll just explode off your body in a single yeah. movement, leaving just <laughs> no sleeves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible problem to have. Um, but what I sometimes have to do with the with the, especially the French with the french jackets and the red coats in particular sometimes i have to line up all the crew and then make them swap and go like why yeah. are you wearing a 48 inch chest when you're clearly like a 38 inch chest you give that to him you take that one you take you swap as well blah, 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 blah. and then it's just like a very silly like have you ever seen um when a crab is like a, a hermit crab is like getting out of its shell or it's it, they found a new shell and it's too big for the one who's found it and so they'll form a it's like a chain and then all swap basically like that oh, that's crew basically like hermit that's exactly crabs. what it's yeah. like it's the one thing i get <laughs> asked the most about this game from people who are interested is do you expect me to drop eight thousand pounds on a perfectly accurate napoleonic <laughs> cost it's like no not really it's um this game, <laughs> not like, even slightly this game like all the feast your eyes and the eye love stuff is a film sim so it's meant to be cin cinematic hollywood-esque rather than one-to-one -one perfect yeah if you want to do one-to-one -one sure. perfect Hell yeah, I love that stuff. I'll shake your hand personally in the car park. Well, <gasps> heard that, folks. And, and then you'll kill Harry your Knight. character. And I'll kill your character in the car park. And take your kit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the nice thing is, is, again, like we have all the uh, the whole Oilop kit storage, which obviously means we can outfit crew and a whole bunch of things. Um, and also there's a lot of archetypes which don't require the same level of investment as other things, right? If you want to be if you want to be like a high-ranking officer and that means you've got to have everything proper that'll probably be kind of expensive but like in sharp most of the rifleman characters in sharp wear like a bandana and have their jacket really open to show off their chest you know and it's just green trousers <laughs> yeah. underneath that right and that kind of is like yeah. your base layers so the jacket's sure. a bit of an investment if you want like a proper one but everything else you can get fairly cheap um the spanish gorillas are really really easy to do you know, just some brown trousers, a waistcoat, a kind of white, slightly fluffy shirt, uh, a poncho or a cape of some kind, and a big hat. You're sorted for a Spaniard. Uh, and the yeah. same is true for all the all the civilian archetypes. Like, you can go on YouTube and type in Austin Party Costumes, and you will come up with 5,000 different tutorials on how to put together a full Regency outfit for, like, £20. Yeah, and the, the Regency dresses are quite easy to make um, yeah. as, a, as a new kind of theme stuff um in particular because it's 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 very forgiving as a as a silhouette i think you can you can make a lot of yeah. changes without necessarily needing to have loads of skills there's um like austin parties didn't know they existed until i started writing for Lord hope turns out they're like a massive thing like yeah. you, you know you think larp is sort of a slightly weird niche community people who are super into jane austen novels very very out there like there's a whole like austin festival in in bar it's it's wild yeah. but anyway it does mean See, there are so yeah. many resources online to get regent to like put together regency era costumes on the cheap uh so it's yeah do do some research uh read through the brief basically and lots of things are available I would love to see more lower class 
um, female characters in this game because we've got an NPC called Fanny the Washwoman and she is my favourite character to write any plot for because she just shows up. She's got a basket full of officers' pants. She will aggressively hand them to them while they're trying to have like an important meeting. <laughs> and, you know, but you can kind of get away with like more kind of um, later half of the 18th century Um with, with if you go with more lower class stuff as well um mm. which it can be easier to get hold of especially the kind of like cottage core stays and um and shifts and that kind of thing um yeah. and it just it just adds a lot to the overall like thing if you've got a nice variety of like this person's wearing stuff that's 10 years out of date because they haven't been to london to see what the latest ateliers are, are putting out there you know this person's sure. wearing something that's 20 years out of date because they robbed it off a corpse, you know? <laughs> it adds a lot <laughs> yeah, to the yeah, game. Yeah. Nice. Because you guys, I really just want to get a shackle hat now and wear it everywhere I go. That yeah. was a big highlight for me. It had so much height. It did. As a short was... man, I need every inch. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well, like, I, I couldn't believe that you introduced this game to the uh, the cinematic universe that is your various characters. Um, oh, the Belvedere uh, family tree. Yeah, awful. Uh, <laughs> Blame Oily for that you, one. You, you, I want this man to go to Legio so he can play, yeah. play Brutus Belvederus. Yeah. Because the idea that the Belvederes have been medical practitioners on the British yeah. Isles for 2,000 years is too good. Like Belvedius, yeah, absolutely. Oh, Belvedius. <laughs> the never leaving Kitty. I'm sorry. I think I think because Harry plays Religio uh, or played the last couple, and Lovely I think job. there's kind of some similarity similarities in the way. But it, it, it's it's the the settings that have a kind of military focus can be really fun because like you've automatically got that hierarchy and you kind of automatically got like you, you can kind of happily play somebody who's quite low on that ladder and and find a really fun niche within it um that kind of removes any kind of um like everybody being the the, the big important shouty man <laughs> you know that, that can sometimes be a, a real issue at lot. Um, especially when people who shouldn't be in charge are in charge because that's that's fun <laughs> i honestly Sorry, had the time Tom. of my life play no it's no problem playing a skeevy private it's everything i wanted and more just to wind up the sergeants and the higher <laughs> players i think i got told off for having my hat crooked about 30 something times yeah good Still never got <laughs> gotta do something it. Yeah, they've got to do something, and and you know, with with most of them, like it, it gets to the point where they've told their mates off for the, for all the usual things, and so we need to send them in some other scrubs so that they can tell them off <laughs> for some things as well. Yeah, they'd be well, they'd the be just standing is... there in his full like provost uniform as I send the eighty seventh deserter to like grovel in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> they let so many of those uh deserters go because they cried and were too they were too sad and so they were just like yeah we can't kill these guys that i was expecting every tragic. single deserter at this game to be <laughs> shot out of hand and i'm slightly yeah. disappointed that they were treated with more leniency than that <laughs> i did love the ones that got lost and ran out of food when they were being inspected they were looking for our bags and just one of us had a sandwich in our bags like yeah we're starving behind enemy lines. Not a crumb of food. <laughs> yeah, that's your emotional sandwich. You got to hang on to that. That's been with, that's been with you since you left London. <laughs> All the way. Uh, hard so, did you guys have any favourite moments over the weekends? Were there any event highlights for you or encounters that really made the special? Well, I'll, I'll let you go first, Kitty. I'll push you firmly oh, no. under this bus. Oh God. Okay. Um, so uh, Harry on Friday night made me take like he didn't tell me until I was literally ready to take the, the players out, but that I was leading the players out on the first walk in, um, and so it was it was yeah no it was all right uh, classic <laughs> I did that to you all the time, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it was a really lovely time to like meet the new players and also realise that like if we haven't told them to put really good shoes on. <laughs> this uh this will be an interesting experience for them because i was like i i was told the route that we were taking them on and um i had a couple of other crew members with me um to like help people along if they needed it but because it had been raining so much like in the in the couple of weeks before that i did have in the back of my mind oh god what if this tree has come over or uh, what if this whole area of the site is one big bog and i just immediately walk them into it like uh 
Um, but there was this lovely moment when um, we were coming back down the hill um, once we'd sort of looped all the way down the track and come back around. Um, so we were on the far end of sight, sort of coming back on ourselves. Um, when I realised that we had two new civilians with us, um, the, this new lady and then the new sort of gentleman surgeon. And um, I also had all these sort of Spaniards who were helping, um, help, you know, crew members who were helping us move things um, and make sure people didn't get lost along the way as well. Um, and we'd set the, the, the rifles off to, to go and scout ahead uh, and find the, the one thing that had been set up that they needed to see on their way back round that was going to set the scene for everything um, that was handily quite well lit so they could see it from a distance. Um, so the rifles were off and then the redcoats were in front of us, like sort of panning out and making sure that if anybody did pop out of the bushes, they were there ready with their rifles ready and everything. Um, and the officers were doing their usual sort of oh, 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 sort of thing. Um, and then these these two new civilians who were very clearly sort of, oh, we're not entirely sure what we're supposed to be doing because we're not in the line of, you know, we're not in the, in the military side of the game and we're not... Um, you know, part of this area, Ooh, what do we do? What do we do? And there was just a moment where like one of them, I think like slightly slipped, but like caught themselves uh, and it was all fine. Um, but being a terrible Spaniard, um, I, I immediately called over um, Dougal, who was playing one of my Spaniards um, and was like, oh, this is Juan. He is uh, he's very, very, very handsome and very, very, very strong. And he will catch you if you fall over. Um, but he is very, very stupid. So do not ask him any <laughs> difficult questions. Um, and uh, and he helped them both down this this hill in a very like exaggerated like oh late my lady like let me help you of course like if you need my hand I'm here and like practically like swept her off her feet and carried but like, like she didn't need it and she was fine but like was ready to like be like <sighs> the, the, the like dashing Spaniard who was going to like flirt with her with with her husband watching um and like helped her down the hill and it was all fine and then it, like leapt across this little um uh, like gully that was quite boggy and one of the new, very new officers immediately started taking off his cloak to like put it down on her, uh, under her feet oh, so she'd be wonderful. able to get up it was just like the most gallant thing I'd seen um and then uh her husband then her in character husband sort of like help was helped down but like far more so like he was he was like delicately being held in, in in hand by both Spaniards who were there and like you know they were like oh sir like, let me help you let me help you and then he was practically carried over this gully by like six riflemen <laughs> like it was that like it immediately set the, the tone for like like these people are upper class and therefore incapable <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know uh, and like you know the, the the um the like gallantry and the like like out of character this Char the, this new player was doing an absolutely fantastic job of like dealing with the terrain and dealing with the, like the lack of light and like the possible dangerous situation uh but in character was like you know ready to be a damsel if it meant that the man in front of her was going to get shot so she didn't have to and things <laughs> and everybody was immediately ready to be shot if it meant that she would survive because she needed to be protected with you know with everything of course, of <laughs> i don't know like, it course. was just like i just immediately was just like oh yeah this is what we're playing again this is really nice like cool like the gender stuff can be difficult to explain in advance but it, but it works. when you're in yeah. it and you and you're there and you're like this is silly and we all know it's silly and nobody's actually being sexist to any of the like female yeah. players or non-binary players or anybody who's playing like a civilian as well you know sure. um, yeah. it's just good vibes <laughs> what yeah, about awesome. you harry harold k knight oh. what was your favorite thing? Harold K. Knight. my favorite part of the game so one of the things I have to admit I enjoy doing is seeing whether the players are doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> uh, so a good example of this was at the last game. Uh, I was like, the players are deep behind enemy lines in French-occupied Spain. I wonder if they have anyone on guard duty. So what the encounter was, was sort of set the scene. The players were in the Viking village, which has like some watchtowers. It's got like a perimeter wall. And then there's a path, which is probably about 800 meters. And then it curves around a little corner. Uh, and the area around there, there's like some dips, there's some trees, there's some scrub land, but it's fairly open. So I timed 10 voltageurs, who are basically French skirmishers, in, right at the far end and went, okay, your brief is sneak into the camp. And then all at once, like if you get like spotted, you know, fire some rounds off, have a little combat. If you don't get spotted, get as close as you can to the players before like firing a big volley. 
so um, I think how it kicked off, I can't remember exactly how. What I distinctly remember was one of the players who was like a like a regular red coat. I was like, oh, the French are attacking. There's gunshots going off inside the camp. Oh, no. I can see one of my friends in that watchtower runs up to the watchtower, goes, oh, who's up there? And just is, ha, 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 le français, <laughs> and is immediately shot in the chest, point blank, by a voltager. He <laughs> managed to sneak into the watchtower inside of the British camp. Oh, incredible. Was but it was because great because oh. time the boxing match to be with the Voltaire invasion. Yes. So at the same time, about thirty minutes previously, I'd sent out an encounter which was, "Hey, all of you lower class, like um, characters, there's like a there's like a Victorian pugilism bout which is about to start. Go and like bid some money, and there'll be some like fun times. Like, get involved in the boxing; it'll be a laugh." Which was all about. It was basically the other side of a big hedge from where the camp was. So all the, you know, all the regular soldiers, all the privates and the corporals will potter off to do this, have a great time. All the officers are sitting in the mess, not knowing that everyone else has left. Uh, so <laughs> I, I just remember someone just being like, where are the bloody men? And someone responded with, I, th- I think they're at a boxing match, sir. <laughs> just, just hearing this cry of, boxing! <laughs> <laughs> No, like <laughs> shots going off. Um, it was one of again. It was one of the. It was the new fan player. His name has completely escaped my mind, uh, which is really terrible of me. But they did the full like run scream across the entirety of the camp, like when the French first started firing. Someone like oh, ran out. Was like, I'll, like I'll protect you. Get into the officers' mess. It's safe in there. And, like you know, people just running around in the dark, just like these random flashes of light as the French were firing in, like over the walls and like from these little like nooks and crannies. It just, it worked super well. It was exactly what I wanted that encounter to be. Oh, incredible. The boxing match was wonderful as well. Some the boxing match thrown. was a personal favourite as well. If you want to talk about the boxing match, feel free. Because I no. will happily hear more about the boxing match. Everything I hear from it, I just enjoy innately. Just the first fight was fantastic. The the big Spanish hero against, was it the Ox of Bristol? Throwing down the, fists. The crew came up with their own names. <laughs> Yeah. I'm pretty sure like the, the bell oh, ringer of Bristol was one or something, something like that. Like that. It was very yeah. silly. So the Ox won the first round. Everyone cheers. British superiority and all that. The Spanish are devastated that the champion had uh, fallen. Then it was one of the riflemen who took out the uh, British boxer. You had uh, Circuit and Wren with fans in the background like, woohoo! Punch him in the dick on the... Uh, oh, don't, don't say that. And did, did those ladies actually say that? That's not the kind of language we expect from you. Uh, it was such good vibes. Money were being thrown around. You had your hype men. Uh, I believe the final bout was Oily versus another rifleman. So the Highland men versus, were down. But, uh, Oli, you, I think, yeah. Yeah, you got the big flash of Oily, these underwear under the kilter. <laughs> It was a fantastic event. And where were they when the camp was under attack? <laughs> having a lovely time, okay? They're allowed a night off. Um, not, it's Tom. the army. It's specifically their oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, maybe not. Um, I've, I've heard a rumor. Have you heard this rumor? I have heard this rumor. I've heard a rumor that there's going to be 16 forlorn hopes, one for every episode of Sharp. Is this correct? Can, can you confirm that? Yeah, the next that? one's Tulio's gold, right? <laughs> <laughs> Please, I don't want to have to do Sharp's gold. No, no, no. It's the best episode. Uh, is that we'll the one where we'll have to get that big there's... box of Aztec gear, open brackets, yeah. dubious, out of the back yeah. of the through store. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we used to have a box that said headdresses in brackets, not racist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, wonderful. Uh, they, 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 even, yeah, they got eaten by mice over lockdown, I think. But, um, uh... yeah, you know. So yeah, we'll have to get all the, so, the Trojan gear out, maybe. <laughs> the are we having are we, are we having sixteen, or is the next one truly the last one in this wonderful chapter of Feast Your Eyes? We've not talked about it ever at all. No, not really. I mean, it's something of I'm really happy to run more. Uh, I've got more ideas, uh, but also I do think that things should, to some degree, run their course. Like I wouldn't want yeah, to run yeah. Forlorn Hope like for five years. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, very yeah. happy with it being super cool and super full of ideas and really just like dense with cool stuff 
and then it having a like an endpoint, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, rather yeah, than that's sort of, understandable. Yeah. Rather than kind of like flog the dead horse, you know, it's like, oh, you're at Fools and Heroes number 3087. <laughs> like, yeah, how many yeah, new yeah. encounters can one team write to some yeah. degree? Harry, right? it's, like Harry, it, it's, like, yeah. it's me and, and all those poor traders who need help from the bandits, Harry. <laughs> Quick, we've got, another, from bandits we've, got another, we've got another Juicy Boys encounter. Quick. Yeah, what disease has the Colonel encounters. got this week? <laughs> One Juicy Boys encounter of every episode of Shark. <laughs> Yeah, Beautiful. I mean, yeah, it's exactly. on brand. <laughs> it's on. It's so I, on brand. Um, I, do, I mean, I exactly it's so right much better when uh, when there's guns involved as well. Like they they simply don't work very well when it's just like we're gonna find you and hit you with swords in the dark. But when you've got the the, the sparks of the um, you know, it immediately yeah. makes the players re- the, the crew members realize that they need to stop talking about mayonnaise and start, <laughs> <laughs> start dying horribly. Exactly. <laughs> I, th- I think um, no end point. Something I always do these days, I, 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 purely because of one, because ever since you did Legio Nightmare, every single time I go to a LARP at Eversley, every I'm like nightmare. <laughs> yeah. I was just like forlorn hope nightmare <laughs> it would be certainly interesting it's Harry I mean, having to write nightmare uh, run forlorn hope I, for the next I, would years. Love to, I would love to write forlorn <laughs> hope nightmare the forlorn hope nightmare is an idea which I kind of keep half joking about because I desperately desperately want it to be real because I already yeah. have so many good ideas of exactly how I would do it um, because it the nice thing gold. is Some I, zombies I will it's, yeah it's exactly it's 87 Aztecs. Um, one for every episode <laughs> of Sharp. And- <laughs> uh, the nice thing about Forlorn Hope, uh, which I think would make it good for a Nightmare game, is it's muskets, right? Uh, Flying yeah. Lead yes. Nightmare. I love, I've played all but one of the Flying Lead Nightmares. But when you have six shots in a gun and you can have two guns, that's a lot of bullets. Yeah. When you've got I one musket know. and it takes like 20 seconds to reload... Things can run at you real fast in 20 seconds. As someone who has played Flying Lead Nightmare with two flintlock pistols, I can attest <laughs> it does add to the drama of trying to reload at night. Because obviously the French, the Napoleonic the military tactic was always, ah, oh, the British are in a line. They can fire three rounds a minute. Us incredibly smart French people are in a column. We can run the distance between us and the British line in column it, after they shoot about two rounds. So we'll take these casualties because swords and bayonets don't need to reload. So why worry about it? Now yeah, imagine sure. that, but rather than French people, it's, I don't know, something worse. Zombies, <laughs> maybe. Something <laughs> worse. <laughs> What's worse than French people, Harry? Oh, oh, I, oh, no. Forcing Ilop to commission 50 of the bug suits from Starship Troopers. <laughs> <laughs> and put all my crew in them. <laughs> we haven't finished yeah, paying off the funny. bears yet, Harry. We're going to use those bears. <laughs> <Not> the bear. <laughs> those bears want an award, Kitty. I don't want to hear a word about that. Uh, incredible. Uh, well, that's all the questions I have off my list. Is there anything you guys want to talk about or shout out or shill whilst you're on? Shill. <laughs> it's the perfect well, well, time I mean, to shill. Forlorn Hope 3. <laughs> uh, the third game, the one we've saved all the SFX budget for, uh, it's it's titled Forlorn Hope The Siege. Uh, the players will be Ooh. in a Spanish town under siege for the whole thing. It's going to be great. It's going to be real good. Uh, uh, if you're interested... Gonna... going on the sale? For the, uh, players? Uh, the 20th of March um, at 7.30pm on the Feast Rise website, uh, which hopefully will be after this podcast comes out. Oh yes, this podcast. Okay, <laughs> uh, Alex is a speedy worker and a godsend. It should hopefully yeah. be out by Friday. Hopefully, we'll see. Friday. That's wow, really that quick. is quick. That's it's great. there's no guarantees of it being this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a Friday. Yeah, I feel, I don't I don't want to commit Alex to like having having to this release pod- this. This podcast. I'm sorry, Alex. I love you. Seven days. One thing. <laughs> <laughs> of sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, what else am I? What else am I shilling at the moment? I don't know. I don't know. Um, oh. We've just while we've been doing this, I have pressed the button to release the information about um, 
another kind of associate game we've got running, which is oh. called Eldritch Isle. Um, Our oh. phone, mine and Morgan's phones have been going off with people already discussing it, so it's off to a good start. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, no which problem. Max Berry, a, a good friend of ours, um, who's um, uh, another regular at Isle Up stuff and Feast Rise stuff and Empire, you might know from Dawn. Uh, he is running a, a kind of Cthulhu-esque kind of event, um, which is uh, currently looking to be a one-shot, but with the potential for for more, uh, like a series of one-shots if it goes well. Um, it's uh, set in 1929, um, so costume for it is very charity shoppable, um, mm-hmm. which is the best thing about like early 20th century stuff. Um, and I've got like 27 tabs open about it, and yet I can't find the one that has all the information me to say um <laughs> if you head over to uh feast your eyes dot events um all the information for all our games are on is on there it's yeah. not dot com or anything it's literally dot events feast your eyes dot nice. events um and yeah we can, you can have a little look at, the, at all the weird stuff we do uh feast your eyes is kind of our our personal business wing a, that we're able to do more crazy stuff um without the kind of you know with we can take more kind of financial uh risks with some of the yeah. concepts because uh, yeah, we sure. don't have to you know um bring in a man with five children and a mortgage and um, lots of potential university bills to pay um he's he, he who is the guy who owns i uh and he ah, um, sure. okay. yeah, runs nice. the kind of film sim uh airsoft events um josh smith who's our business partner for that kind of stuff but um yeah for feast your eyes it's all josh very weird never let me run a napoleonic game <laughs> Well, I hope well, you're happy. You're, yeah. you're <laughs> contributing to keeping me in poverty with all these extra <laughs> you've got on. It's like, I don't need any yeah. more tickets. Oh, these are That's what we're aiming to do. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> other two things, I guess, we've got uh, we've got The Portents, which is a, uh, a, a game where it's like a fantasy game where you play the baddies. And it's kind of Monsters mm. Inc. esque kind of uh, fantasy setting where you're playing all um, cultists and um, monsters and gribblies and necromancers and, and creatures who are going through yeah, portals yeah. and then going to like a lovely, delightful fantasy kingdom and then like harvesting the the fear that you can generate from these lovely little hobbits mm. and elves. It's, and... Very, <laughs> it's very Overlord esque, if you know that. Yeah, game. very. Um, well, if you if you have a cool monster concept in mind or just want to make some cool monster kits, this is the game. Turn up as any like classic fantasy monster and it'll work great yeah here's a free one get four friends together one necromancer (laughs) and four skeletons you you really really want somebody to do this date i'm desperate for someone to run this concept (laughs) it it feels like it feels like monsters inc meets the board game villainous that's the vibe it's very much like that yeah yeah Yeah, that's run by the fear of people yeah absolutely (laughs) Uh, and uh, we've got a couple of um, Song of Ice and Fire games that will be later in the year as yes. well. Yes. Um, one one that was uh, written by our friend Ren, who helped a lot with the, the kind of um, equality and diversity and like gender stuff with Lawn Hope um, and plays the lovely nurse Mary. And um, that's the Dragon's Hunt. Information for, for that should be coming in the next couple of weeks, um, which is um, a little bit more. Uh, you play the actual main characters from Game of Thrones. Sure. Um, and we've been, we've been going through the... Um, we've been trying to figure out who the people that we... Because there's, there's a lot of people who technically hold a lot of power at this particular year in the Game of Thrones setting. Um, but some of them, very boring people to play. <laughs> um, so we've been trying, <laughs> yeah. trying to figure out who, who would be more fun to be around. You know, like... Like there was one that we added yesterday. Um, like I, I think it's a Lannister called like Gerald or something. Like, <laughs> um, he's just like the Doesn't coolest Lannister. He's just a cool guy. Like why shouldn't he be in it? <laughs> he has a he has a silver sword and cool <laughs> eyes and hair. He's, he's the best hair. guy around. <laughs> <laughs> he's got great hair. Um, <laughs> oh, not, not yeah, Gerald of the Riviera. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yes, um, so we're, we're we're looking forward to putting a bit more information about that in the awesome. next couple of weeks. And that's feasturize.events. <laughs> <laughs> that's feasturize.events. Uh, yes. Check that out. Um, As we yeah. say, they're um, all terrible games. Don't go. Yeah, don't go. go. Most of them all, so don't bother. Please. Oh, I, think, <laughs> I, I should also say, we've got a few tickets left for Legio and also Second Breakfast, which are both I Lock games that are both award-winning and people have a lot of love for. Um, yes. But yeah. I think if... 
I think we're still in the at the position where if Legio doesn't get enough tickets, it might not be able to run. So we're really go to Legio, there. everyone. Go to Legio. Be Legio scary Roman is, people. The best way to describe my love for Legio is just off my own back as a player who loves the game. I wrote a full costume brief for Legio, which is significantly better than the costume brief I wrote for my own game. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it just um, you don't need to wear trousers underlined 20 times on 20 pages <laughs> yeah but then there's like another 20 pages of like his <laughs> cloak and his picture of Johnny <laughs> <laughs> incredible thank you both so much for coming on <laughs> yeah sorry I've, I can only apologise for the last like god knows how long of rambling we're just just no, like it's great. It's a pleasure. We are the tangent <laughs> podcast. And yeah, we love it. I think it's you. You get you, you. It's really funny how I feel like I it, like guests often keep us on track, but I feel like we've all just fed into each other this afternoon. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> energy. <laughs> <laughs> how many of us yeah. have got undiagnosed uh, neurodivergencies that oh, I'm, I'm, medication? I'm, I'm, di- I'm diagnosed. <laughs> it's <laughs> I'm only diagnosed with dyslexia. I can't use that stuff. <laughs> But yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. Absolute uh, pleasure. And oh, well, uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Yeah, no, it's yeah. been great to talk about it. Um, and if anyone and has any thank- questions about Forlorn Hope, join the Facebook page. Feel free to ask me on there. <laughs> I'm super happy to Shout- talk about it literally all the time. I can't stop thinking about... Find this man the on the Peninsula. Thursday Night of Empire and ask him questions about the Peninsula <laughs> War. And will, will Find me when I'm out at my local something. shops and shake me. <laughs> yell at me about hats. It's, I've fully got a picture in my head of that meme of that guy in a nightclub <laughs> just next to some poor woman just like talking about, talking I, about the peninsula. I am both sides of that. <laughs> and I am also both sides of that. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Uh, just harass Harry Knight and Kitty about the peninsula. Uh, yeah, tell uh, us facts. On my Instagram account and harass me on there as well. Yeah. No. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. That's been a lovely thank, time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being on. And thank you uh, to everybody at home for listening. I hope you enjoyed learning about Forlorn Hope. And I hope you managed to get to the next one as well, as well as some of the amazing events that these guys do. Um, as always, please uh, you know, like, subscribe, follow wherever you are. Remember, I am legally obliged to read out every single five star review. So this is your perfect opportunity to put in an advert. Uh, or or anything else you want me to say <laughs> into into uh, reviews on podcast. I will rev- I will read out no other review. So even if you want to slate us, you have to give us a five star review. Please slate Dawn, <laughs> and I will read it out on the next podcast. Um, but yes, uh, we've also got a Patreon. You can find it Fable Top, and then we should be coming back to some a few more events coming up. But once again, thank you very much everybody for listening, uh, and we will see you when we are back. I'm not quite sure when we're going to be back, to be fair. Uh, it depends if we want to do an episode about crewing on Full On Hope yeah, we'll or you're going go. into the woods. Okay. Yeah, welcome to the forest. Into uh, the woods. Into the woods. I'm going to a rogue trader LARP as well at the same time. So there'll be interesting things coming up. Yeah. So perfect. So, well, thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and we will see you again when we see you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.